everybody. Uh, I have a little lunch break, so I just decided I'm gonna do a little PowerPoint presentation live on our Facebook page. I'm not sure how this is all gonna play out, um, especially because I don't know how strong our Wi-Fi is at work. But we're gonna give this a shot because I just wanted to talk about something, uh, especially related to the immune system uh, with what we're going through right now and the importance of barrier systems within our system. And when we talk about the barrier systems, what I'll be talking about today are the blood brain barrier and the, the gut barrier, so the intestinal lining. But we have barrier systems in place to help keep us healthy and to help protect us from external toxins from our environment um, and external stressors. So other barrier systems are our skin, our lungs, but the two uh, really important ones I wanted to talk about were the gut and the brain. So throughout this little presentation, we're going to be just citing some little research articles uh, just because I, I think it'll be fun to talk about. But um, basically, intestinal barrier function. Uh, this is a paper that just talks, gives a general overview about regulation and disease pathogenesis regarding what happens when the intestinal lining starts to break down. So the intestinal epithelium is a single cell layer that constitutes the largest and most important barrier against the external environment. And I would agree with that statement because I do think, uh, especially regarding like food stressors, um, the gut is really the first area to start to be affected when we're putting things into our system and it can start to break down. And what I found is that when the gut starts to break down, other areas within the system start to break down. So the protein networks connecting epithelial cells uh, form three adhesive complexes. So basically, if you think about these barrier systems, the easiest way to think about them are little screen doors in our, in our body. So in our gut, we have a screen door. And if there's any little hole or if these little tight junctions um, start to break down, that's when bigger, larger proteins can get into our system, get into our bloodstream and start to cause inflammation inflammation and uh, other, other issues. So the gut is made up of some really important cells and most importantly, some, some intestinal tight junctions, which will stop these uh, food proteins and large molecules getting into our system. So the blood brain barrier, uh, basically the same thing, they just look a lot different. And I would say regarding gut and brain, um, the gut, the gut, barrier versus the brain barrier, the gut is the first affected. What happens if you get some inflammation within your, in your bloodstream is then these pathogens can start to knock on the door of your blood brain barrier and your blood brain barrier is like a screen door for your brain. So it keeps all the bad stuff out of your brain. Um, the only problem is, is when those little bad pathogens get into your bloodstream and they consistently knock on the door, that's when you start to see some breakdown in the blood brain barrier. So Blood brain barrier is there to help keep your brain nice and healthy. Your intestinal tight junction lining is there to keep your gut healthy. And it's also to help have proper immune responses and uh, healthy digestion and also healthy cognitive function for the, for the brain. So the blood brain barrier is a term used to describe the unique properties of the microvasculature of the central nervous system. These vessels are continuous uh, but also they contain a series of additional properties that allow them to tightly regulate movement of molecules. So things can get in, things can get out, but it's well regulated when things aren't broken down. It's also really, really important to protect the CNS from toxins, pathogens, inflammation, injury, and disease, which we talked about. So here's a picture. Uh, on the left, you see your gut immune barrier. Um, so this kind of is, it's a nice little lining all the way through your gut. So you can think of kind of, this is the intestinal lumen. So this is where food's hanging out. This is more of the blood area. And down here is where you see a lot of what's happening with the immune regulation. So when you put food into your system, it should kind of just pass along. And these little areas, these little cells should just basically collect what it needs from the food, pull it in to the system for nutrition and, and for, um, for using, using for energy. And then over here you have, it looks different, but it's a similar mechanism. Uh, these are astrocytes. So these are brain cells. Um, but what they do is they almost, I, I imagine them as like, if you can imagine your, 
your blood vessels is like a tube, which they are, but imagine these like big claws kind of hanging over them, protecting the tube, kind of adding a nice little layer of Play-Doh. Whenever I see these astrocytes, I think of like a Play-Doh kind of just like covering over to make sure that nothing, nothing gets in or passes through the tight junction. Uh, so this is your blood brain barrier here, and these are both in the healthy state. So the question is, is what does it look like when things start to break down? Well, as you can see, again, like imagine a screen door, um, all these little tight junctions are nice and healthy. So all these larger molecules that are kind of floating around outside in the intestinal lumen, so they're still inside your body, but outside of uh, the blood vasculature, they're, they're able to kind of sneak through when you see a disruption or a breakdown in that screen door. So once these larger molecules can get in, they can initiate some sort of immune response um, that may be unwanted or unregulated in nature. So this is, this is a little depiction of what a broken uh, gut barrier looks like. So disruption, or sometimes you'll hear this term leaky gut, but it's basically a disruption of tight junctions within the intestinal lumen and the intestinal lining. So those are broken down big things can get in. What I've seen is if you have breakdown in the gut, all these little pathogens can get into the blood uh, system, into the stream, and then they can start to make their way up to the brain and creepy crawl their way all up into the brain, start knocking on the blood brain barrier's door and start to cause breakdown there as well. And what happens is, as you can see here, you, those, you, you basically get a loss of that tight junction integrity starts to open up, those little claws start to open up and then molecules and pathogens start to get in where they shouldn't be. So if you can think about it, um, basically it's someone who's really not invited to the party, but they're in the party and they're causing a little bit of a mess. That's what happens when you get leaky gut and leaky brain. So there, there's a lot of conditions that can lead to or cause issues with breaking down of the barrier systems. So diabetes mellitus and blood brain barrier dysfunction. This basically, this paper talks about how if you have dysregulation in your blood sugar, it can cause impairment in the blood brain barrier, which is pretty scary because uh, you know, I, I work with a lot of patients that do have uh, blood sugar dysregulation, type two diabetes. Um, and type two diabetes can be thought of as an inflammatory chronic condition where you get dysregulation of blood sugar, too many highs, too many lows, and those highs can, can cause dysregulation in other systems. And eventually this uh, altered glycemic index and glycemic control can cause breakdown in the blood brain barrier system. So it, that's something that's really important. I think we don't really think about is, hey, uh, if you have diabetes, a lot of times people will have conditions that affect their peripheral um, system. So they'll sometimes get numbness and tingling in their legs, which is called peripheral neuropathy. But it's important to remember too that your brain is a peripheral organ as well. And so this peripheral uh, organ is getting affected by breaking down the blood, bar blood brain barrier system. And then creepy crawlers or little pathogens are getting into the, into the blood uh, vasculature of the brain causing issues. So diabetes mellitus, that's type two diabetes. Uh, acute stress. We all, we've talked about this a lot before on Brain Chat, but acute stress can really break down the brain. And stress has a really funky way of beating up the brain, but what it can do is, uh, this paper talks about how it can really break down blood brain barrier integrity. So again, the whole purpose of this little talk is just to remind us, hey, what's really important with our health? Well, one thing that's really important is healthy barrier systems. And two, what I find to be the most important barrier systems are the gut and the brain. So if acute stress, uh, we know that it can cause gastrointestinal dysfunction, but sometimes we forget that it can really knock on the door of the blood brain barrier and cause some brain dysfunction as well. And I've shown some slides on the page before where acute stress not only does have functional, um, cause functional changes to the brain, but it can also cause structural changes to the brain. And there's been a lot of papers that cite this. And one of the, coolest ones that I've seen is by uh, a researcher out of Yale, Dr. Arnston. She's published two papers and she talks about how the front part of the brain with not just acute stress, but then chronic stress starts to shut down and it starts to dysregulate. And we know that the front part of the brain is responsible for basically acting as like the break in other areas of the brain, um, especially an area called the amygdala. So what happens is, is you get this dysregulation of frontal lobe integrity. So the front part of the brain doesn't work well, then your amygdala starts to kind of overreact and it's not, it's not being um, braked on by the frontal lobe as well. So you start to see efficiency in these stress 
for um, these poor emotional pathways. And then you see deregulation or dysregulation in the frontal lobe pathways, and it becomes this chronic cycle. So not only does acute stress break down blood brain barrier system, but then uh, that can lead to chronic stressors, which can cause structural and functional changes to the brain. So I thought that was pretty important. Blood brain barrier disruption induced by chronic sleep loss. Um, we have these like huge trees in our neighborhood. And two weeks ago, one of our trees fell backwards and hit one of the neighbor's house. So I've been trying to have this tree company come out and take down the rest of our trees, but they're a little bit backed up. So I've been losing sleep over these trees not being taken down. And I know it's not good for me, um, but it's a stressor because I know, you know, I don't want anyone's house to be affected, especially our house and our neighbor's houses. Uh, so I want these trees taken down, but point of the story was is I've been losing sleep over it and I know it's not good for my brain because it can cause chronic low-grade inflammation. It can disrupt the blood-brain barrier um, and we just know that how vital sleep is and how regenerative sleep is for our bodies and for our brain. So it's important to remember that when we are losing sleep, the chronicity of that, it can really have a negative impact on our barrier systems, especially our blood-brain barrier. Uh, and then as this is this one I, I thought was interesting because this paper talked about changes in intestinal tight junction permeability associated with industrial food additives explain the rising incidence of autoimmune disease. So this is a paper from 2015, but basically it talks about how um, autoimmune disease is on the rise due to these poor additives in these foods. So we're not eating real food anymore, and it's causing a lot of disruption disruption in our barrier systems. It's um, causing immune dysregulation and autoimmunity, but it's just, it's bad stuff. So stuff like glucose, salt, emulsifiers, organic solvents, gluten, microbial transglutaminase, and nanoparticles are extensively and increasingly used by the food industry. Uh, claim the manufacturers to improve the quality of food, but they don't. Um, all of the aforementioned additives increase intestinal permeability by breaching the integrity of tight junction paracellular transfer, which is a little tight junction area in the gut. So basically it disrupts the gut and disruption of the gut, chronic disruption of the gut can lead to immune dysregulation, which can lead to autoimmunity. So here's a neat little slide. Um, I believe this is from Cyrix Labs. They do a lot of different testing, but basically it talks about how different, different types of exogenous stressors. So stress, medications, um, dysregulation basically can cause inflammation, which can cause uh, opening in the tight junctions, which can then initiate an immune response. And when that happens, it's basically like you get this crazy dysregulation of immune activity, and there's a loss of specificity in how your immune um, cells react to what they should actually react to. So you can get things like cross reactivity, which basically means that the immune system thinks one thing is one thing and it's attacking another thing that it shouldn't be attacking. So lots of bad things can happen when you have breakdown in your barrier systems. And that was just the purpose of this slide here. So the ways of communication are basically, they're pretty simple. You have uh, gut to brain. So you have production of neuropeptides, activation of immune cells, cytokines and interleukins, um, production of microbes, and then afferent vagal signaling, which if you read about vagus nerve, the majority of the fibers of the vagus nerve are afferent in nature. So some of the research shows like 70, 80, 90% of those fibers are afferent, which means from the gut to the brain. And then about like 10, 20% are efferent, which means brain to gut. So the other way of communicating is brain to gut. And basically you have the front part of the brain speaking to the brain stem, speaking to the gut. You've got um, a little bit more inner regions of the brain, like the insular cortex and the anterior cingulate gyrus communicating with the brain stem and the gut. You've got that pontine integration, which is the middle part of your brain stem. And then you've got those efferent signals from the vagus nerve, which means brainstem to gut, which isn't the majority of the cells or the um, nerves, but it's a good chunk. And you can use those as a therapy, which is what's really pretty hot in the research right now. So what conditions may be associated with altered gut brain communication? Um, this one has been talked about a lot, but Parkinson's disease. So basically what they're talking about uh, is how Parkinson's may start in the gut. And I've done a couple of talks on this and people have 
quote, um, basically commented like, hey, this makes no sense. Like how could your gut cause something um, in your brain? Like that doesn't make any sense to me. But if you look at the way that everything's connected and look at ways of communication, like we just talked about, then it can make a lot of sense. So basically what this paper talks about is that you can have an inflammatory trigger, which initiates an immune response. You get an increased immune response, which impacts your gut microbiota. It'll increase intestinal permeability, which is not good. That means you have opening of those tight junctions. You get an increased expression and aggregation of something, a protein called alpha synuclein, which is very commonly found in Parkinson's patients. With that happening, um, you get chronic intestinal inflammation over time, um, increased permeability, systemic inflammation. So this is when those little, those little buggers are getting into the bloodstream and now they're making their way up to the, the door of the brain and they're knocking on the blood brain barrier. And that can cause that constant irritation to the blood brain barrier can cause increased permeability of the blood brain barrier. And then it can also just transmit from gut to brain. Uh, this is creepy. So these little uh, proteins can transmit from gut to brain by, if you think about it in a cartoonish type way, climbing up the vagus nerve. So climbing up those afferent fibers into specific, uh, very important brain areas. So this is more of a systemic uh, blood related thing. This talks more about like a physical pathway. So they're kind of like cruising up the road, uh, these little alpha synuclein proteins via the vagus nerve, which in that sense, it's not great that we have so many um, fibers that are afferent in nature. Uh, so then what happens is you get more intestinal inflammation, further promoting um, systemic inflammation, uh, which is further promoting synuclein pathology in the brain to promote neuroinflammation. Neuroinflammation in the brain is what drives neurodegeneration that characterizes Parkinson's disease. So these little buggers can creep up the vagus nerve or they can creep up through the bloodstream and knock on the blood brain barriers um, door. And then they can get into areas that are responsible for keeping your brain healthy. And in Parkinson's disease, an area that's most commonly affected is the basal nuclei or the basal ganglia. And that's an important area of the brain for movement. So with Parkinson's, uh, some of the common symptoms that you see are masked facial expressions. So they don't look like they're happy. Uh, they have like kind of like a sad dull look on their face. You see changes in their movement. You see resting tremors where their hands shouldn't be moving and it's moving. So you see these neuro-related issues from uh, a gut-related pathology. So that's how the gut and the brain can be connected just regarding Parkinson's disease. Um, this is basic, I like this because it showed the picture of what we were just talking about. Uh, so this paper actually goes into possibilities for food-based therapies, but you can see here, these are the little alpha synuclein proteins, the little aggregates, jumping on the vagus nerve and then hitching a ride all the way up into important areas that are involved with um, Parkinson's disease. And then you have over here kind of showing more of like the systemic immune response due to a leaky gut. But either way, they're creeping up and causing lots of issues. So when these little proteins kind of deposit, what they, what they do is they, they alter the transmission between the nerves. So you, they basically kind of like occupy space and they're not doing anything productive. So they're kind of just there causing a lot of uh, more harm than good. And then you get altered neurocommunication, um, which changes the plasticity in the system, uh, which can create neurodegeneration. And it can further drive neuroinflammation as well. Um, so how about the other neurodegenerative disease most commonly talked about, Al Alzheimer's disease. So this paper, I don't have any cool pictures for you, but basically it talks about the role of gut microbiota and nutrients in amyloid plaque formation, which is the protein most commonly associated with Alzheimer's disease. So considering there's undefined amounts of LPSs, which are lipopolysaccharides, which basically they're kind of like broken down little proteins of cell walls that cause uh, inflammation um, and amyloids in the human gut, it's possible that the human gut microbiota might play a role in uh, the pathogenesis of um, Alzheimer's disease. So again, uh, and this actually talked about, so in particular alterations of the gut microbiota and an increase in the gut's permeability might lead to an overall increase in systemic inflammation, 
neuroinflammation, dysfunction of specific brain regions, such as the cerebellum, the hippocampus. Um, and this goes on to talk about the development of insulin resistance, uh, which isn't good for blood sugar regulation. So crazy, crazy stuff, uh, just from talking about the health of the, the barrier systems in the gut and how it can lead to neuroinflammatory conditions and neurodegenerative diseases. So kind of dialing it back on the scale to more of what you see in younger kids, um, gut microbiota and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So this paper talks about stuff even before the kids are born, um, which I found really interesting. And it talked about what mom's health was like, what the mom's uh, diet was like. Are they obese? Are they overweight, underweight? Um, do they have blood sugar issues? So what are things like before the baby is conceived? And then what is life like for the baby with mom? Um, so are there maternal infections? Uh, is there stress? Uh, is there, are, this can all lead to basically alterations in the gut microbiota. And then once the baby's born, what are they exposed to? So um, are they of early gestational age? Uh, what was the delivery mode? Because the research shows that that does make a difference, vaginal versus C-section, and the composition of the gut microbiota via either one of those. Uh, early life infections and stress. Are they exposed to antibiotics, different medications? Um, how are they feeding? Breastfeeding versus bottle feeding. And then well, all that can lead to alterations in gut microbiota, which can change the functioning of the brain, which I just found so interesting. Um, and basically, you know, what it talks about is if you have altered gut microbiota, it can lead to symptoms of ADD, ADHD. Uh, basically, normal gut microbiota would favor more of an optimal brain function, theoretically, hypothetically, but still, interesting paper. Uh, how about autism? Pretty much very similar uh, in nature. What's mom's health like before? Uh, what's mom's and baby's health like during? What, what are the exposures uh, after baby's born? What is baby exposed to? All that can lead to alterations in vagus nerve functioning, uh, immune function, gut microbiota, and then gut brain communication. And then that can further uh, or subsequently basically make or lead to changes in brain function. So just interesting stuff when we're talking about gut brain. So there's, there's so many possibilities um, related to brain, gut, gut brain. And you know, it even goes into, the research even goes into talking about uh, chronic pain conditions. So alterations in gut microbiota can lead to systemic inflammation which can lead to chronic pain conditions, cardiovascular risk, alterations in nerve functioning, like in multiple sclerosis, neuropsychiatric issues like anxiety, depression, um, and then obesity. So there's so many different conditions that could be affected if our barrier systems aren't intact. And it's not to say that if you don't have an intact system, you're gonna get this, but you know, I think it's fair to say that the healthier our barrier systems are, the less likely we are to um, suffer from some of these issues. So the question always is, is can we modulate function by using the uh, axis? And we definitely can. Um, there are neurological exercises we can do and there's also nutritional stuff we can do. So this, is, this paper talked about modulation of gut brain axis with probiotics. And they did some studies with little mice and rats, but then they did a lot of studies on humans um, and they used different strains of probiotics. So you'll, you see like all the strains listed here, we have bifido, um, we have lactobacillus, but what they did was um, they listed the duration, how they were given, and then what some of the effects were. So I won't read all these to you, but you can see things like uh, influence brain activity and emotional centers, less psychological distress, improved mood, uh, reduced um, rumination and aggressive cognition. That's really important. Reduced constipation. It's not always about the brain. You got to make sure you're pooping too. Um, and improved cognition as well. So just from taking a supplement, uh, taking a probiotic or eating probiotic rich foods can make positive changes to the gut brain axis. And it can change emotional centers. It can change um, cognitive control centers. So really important stuff. Uh, this goes back to that paper, uh, but basically, or I'm sorry, this is another paper. This is a good paper. So basically with this paper, they talked about, you know, 
eustasis. So what it looked like with normal, healthy, functioning brain, normal, healthy, functioning gut, and good, healthy vagus nerve communication. And then in Parkinson's disease, they listed some of the changes that you see. So they're more prone to feeling pain or chronic pain symptoms. Uh, depression and anxiety can be uh, increased. Behavioral changes. So, you know, socially they're not as um, uh, engaging or they're not going out as much. They just seem a little bit more depressed. And then on the GI side, they have increased GI disturbances. Most likely what you'll see is a decreased motility and increased constipation. And what that means is that the less things are moving down here, the less they're going to be moving out. So you're more constipated. And um, that can lead to systemic inflammation, which can contribute to pain symptoms. And this paper talked about how, you know, taking exogenous probiotics can maybe or potentially alter those effects. So it could drop your pain, drop depression, anxiety, make behavioral changes in a positive sense, and also get things moving. So increase your GI motility and decrease your constipation. So pretty cool paper. Um, and then, yeah, this is, this is another, just there's so many good papers, especially on vagus nerve right now. Um, but this, this is just showing you some of the pathways of the vagus nerve. And this talks about how vagus nerve is bidirectional in nature. Uh, this one mentions that the afferent fibers are 80% and the efferent fibers are 20% represented by the larger rectangle. So this is all information going into the brain. This is all information in the purple leaving the brain. Um, but I won't read all of it to you. Basically, vagus nerve efferent fibers can reduce digestive inflammation and reduce intestinal permeability by tight junction reinforcement. These actions of vagal efferent fibers can indirectly modulate microbiota composition. So if we can access the efferent fibers of the vagus nerve and make the vagus nerve talk from brain to gut a little bit better, maybe we can make some positive changes in their barrier system, right? So we can create better tight junction reinforcement. So here's a paper that talked about, um, I believe this was auricular uh, transcutaneous vagus nerve simulation. So basically what they did was they took electrical impulses and put them on different areas of the ear and they point out different acupuncture areas. So this is a Shen Men, very, very popular area in acupuncture that has lots of health benefits. Um, a lot of the research is also showing that this area in particular, the Simba Concha of the ear, is uh, very accessible to one of the branches of the vagus nerve. But this was a cool paper because it basically talked about um, helping to treat depression by doing what's called transcutaneous vagus nerve simulation. So basically using a neuromodulatory therapy, so doing something to the ear to activate the efferent fibers of the vagus nerve to increase brain gut communication. But then it also talked about how it's affecting brainstem areas. Um, you can see in here, these are little areas. This is the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus. This is called the nucleus tractus solitarius. This is called the locus ceruleus. This is the parabrachial nucleus. And here you have your amygdala and your hypothalamus. So basically all these important brainstem areas using uh, uh, different types of pathways um, into the frontal lobe uh, and hitting some subcortical areas that are responsible for attention, cognition, and basically good cortical control just by stimulating the ear. So I thought that was crazy and it really speaks on behalf of the effects of uh, the positive effects that acupuncture can have, but also using other types of um, ways to tap into the brain to make the brain body connection better. And just to wrap things up, um, you know, we talk a lot about plasticity in the system and the importance of plasticity, but as I mentioned, constant inflammation um, in the gut can lead to constant in, or uh, some sort of chronic inflammatory response in the brain. And you have to think about inflammation that's not checked. So again, inflammation is good, but if it goes on for too long, it can cause a lot of issues. And what I tell patients and people is that when you have inflammation in your system, it's almost like trying to get a message across from A to B in a thunderstorm. So let's say you're having a conversation with someone and they're standing across a field and you can hear each other nicely, the sun's shining, uh, there's no clouds in the sky, uh, there's no background noise or anything. So you guys are just talking, even though you're pretty far away, you can hear each other you can communicate really well. Then a thunderstorm rolls in. You can't really hear each other anymore. You're having to talk louder. Uh, there's flashes of light and thunder and rain. There's all these other things happening. So the communication gets screwed up. And that's what happens in these chronic inflammatory conditions. You start to lose point A to point B communication between nerves. 
and that can alter perturbed plasticity, which means that these pathways can become less efficient because they may not be used as much or they're getting beaten up by the inflammatory um, mediators and markers. So just to wrap it up, one last paper, uh, the effect of inflammation and its reduction on brain plasticity and MS. So MS is, it's pretty scary and interesting because MS can kind of be very silent for a long period of time. Um, and some of the research shows that it doesn't really show up on MRI until it's been there for quite a, quite a bit of time. And with MS, uh, basically what happens is inflammation can damage connection uh, between brain regions, hindering both spatial and temporal coherence of signal transmission. Uh, that's necessary for plasticity to effectively drive recovery. So basically, inflammatory issues uh, causing nerve changes can alter plasticity and make it more difficult to recover and get healthier. So I just wanted to wrap that up by saying thanks. And I don't know how to take questions on this. Um, and I started out kind of fumbling because I didn't know, but... <laughs> Hey guys, I'm just checking in. Funny, we just talked about it. Do, do, do. Cool. No one has questions for me. That's awesome because I should probably get back to work. But I had these little slides laying around and figured I'd show you. So I hope everyone's doing well, staying safe. And I hope you guys have a great day. And we will talk to you guys soon. Goodbye.